When it comes to e-commerce, first, we just need to understand what e-commerce is and is it for you? I know it looks like and seems like anyone and everyone could just hop on, put their product and service online and just blow up. Uh, and many of the people I follow would lead you to believe that, which is not entirely untrue. However, there are certain strategies that work for companies that really are able to scale and there are habits that prevent you from scaling. And that is why my guest Casey Luck, founder of Luck and Company, came on to talk to me about how important email for e-commerce is. So she's gonna break it down for us, talk about some of the detriments, some of the strategies that you can use, and how many email flows does it take uh, before you actually gain some traction. And also, more importantly, she talks about how people really, really love acquisition, but fail to pay attention to the upsides of retention. So here we go. I just want to start with the absolute fundamentals of what I believe is the aspiring entrepreneurs, low hanging fruit, which is e-commerce. Everyone is like, I can sell this, I can flip this, there's all these options. There's no excuses why you can't make six figures and start you know, your new journey this year. Tell me exactly what e-commerce is and, and why you got into it in the first place. And then we'll talk about how it's evolved a little. Sure. Um, it's so funny that you say that because um, I run an agency working with e-commerce company. So we are not an e-commerce uh, company, but we work with them all day, every day. And I think every day about what e-commerce store I can start because I just see what great of a business that is. And I just keep thinking about that, that every day. Let's define e-commerce so that we have that terminology going forward on this call. I see e-commerce as any business that has an online store. So if you're a business selling specifically physical products online where people, your customers can buy it online um, and then you ship the products to them. I see that as an e-commerce store. And there are a few different variations. There are e-commerce stores that also have a brick and mortar business um, and all of your, um, you know, the traditional businesses, the brick and mortar stores that, you know, Macy's and all of the big ones, um, they all now have the e-commerce branch. Um, a lot of e-commerce stores choose to also sell on marketplaces such as Amazon, the biggest one, also an obvious choice. And then another word for e-commerce stores is direct to consumer brands. So a direct to consumer brand is any company that in addition to selling through distributors such as other brick and mortar stores or selling on marketplaces such as Amazon, they also sell directly to their consumer on their own website. And there are companies that only do direct to consumer and then there are companies that do direct to consumer plus marketplaces plus distributors plus wholesalers. What are then the obvious advantages. And again, this, this audience has all different kind of levels of business acumen. So I'm not insulting anyone's intelligence, of course. So you said some have brick and mortar, right? So, mm -hmm. okay. At what point does that brick and mortar say we need to have a marketplace online? Or at what point, if you are aspiring mm -hmm. entrepreneur with a product and I am making them like every hero entrepreneur story, I started in my garage and I was making these protein bars and whatever. How do I make the decision, you know, like do that I'm going to, you know, go direct to consumer or I'm going to have an e-commerce or a marketplace online, or I actually want to, you know, have physical inventory here at my home and, and go that way. Mm -hmm. Well, the obvious advantage of um, running your own direct to consumer brand or having an e-commerce store is that you own the customer journey from start to finish, and you also own your branding. So um, as you can imagine, if you sell through Amazon, there are a lot of things that you can't control. So Amazon doesn't give you information on the customers that buy through Amazon. Um, you can't directly email them and market or remarket to them. Also, I mean, like if you're running ads um, and if you want to send traffic to your Amazon product page, I mean, it's not a complete waste of money, but you're just <laughs> giving Amazon free traffic. 
Um, yeah. And of course, Amazon, it's like, it's, you know, like, it's like YouTube. Um, you send somebody to your YouTube video and then the next thing you know, the person watches cats or something like that. <laughs> Same happens on Amazon. You send people to your product page on Amazon and then next thing you know, they're shopping. I don't know what people I, shop on Amazon. No, that's so funny. That seems so <laughs> unbelievably obvious and I never actually thought of it. Like buy my book on Amazon, but yes, like, you initially think that's going to help me get on a bestseller list or whatever and blah, blah, blah. And then any, everyone could get my book and pre-order it on Amazon because you can't pre-order it a lot of other places. But yes, inevitably that serves them in a far larger <laughs> capacity. And I, I didn't think of that. But what about when you have the physical inventory, you have your brick and mortar, and then you're like, okay, like what is the, what is the decision point that says like, we need to put stuff out there? I think um, it's just the next step in the company's growth. And at some point, um, if, if you're a small brick and mortar store, if you're only in a couple locations, um, it's very obvious that pretty soon you just run out of the target audience that you can target in your geography. So if you're in a little town or even in a couple cities, the populations of those cities is your limit. And if you want to go beyond that limit and sell to everybody nationally or even internationally, you have to go online. Plus e-commerce, like online sales as a percentage of total retail is growing rapidly. Yes. And I think at the beginning of 2020, it was predicted to be like 12 or 13% of retail. <laughs> and then COVID happened and everybody started shopping online, including, you know, everybody's grandparents. And so now it's massive um, and it's only strengthening and reinforcing the behavioral loop for customers. A habit loop where they're just in the habit of ordering online and so more and more people are gonna first look online and see if they can buy something online as opposed to shopping offline so it's just a decision for every business has to make uh, whenever they're ready to grow um, yeah. and get to the next stage um, i would say there aren't many big downsides to being online that overweigh the upsides yeah let me ask this is strictly out of curiosity are there any products that thrive that have surprised you and are there any that people would think do really well online but just don't actually reach their potential and this is just you know because you're experienced mm -hmm. there and i'm just curious well i guess a little bit surprising would be the food industry or mm -hmm. anything that you have to you you'd think that you'd want to try first before ordering um, and especially, you know, in the vertical, like snack bars or health bars, um, they can sell by item online. You have to sell, uh, you know, a box of six, at least four, six or more. And that's a big first purchase for a new customer. Um, and normally you'd want to try one bar first before signing up for a bigger box. Um, and yet that industry and that vertical is thriving and growing like crazy. So that's an interesting one supplements too i don't know how surprising that is i feel like supplements have been for sure thriving for a while online yeah. as for your other question uh something that i would expect to do really well online but uh not do that well i haven't come across anything that you'd think would go super well and is struggling i haven't sure. seen that okay so you said you, I mean, your agency works with e-commerce brands and companies. What was it for you that made you say, that is the space I want to be in and these are the people I want to help. These are the types of companies I want to help. How did you approach that? So I've been doing email my whole life. Uh, my whole career has been connected to email marketing and it's, I feel like it's the most unsexy marketing channel but I consider myself lucky that I just kind of uh, got into it. And it was my first job that got me into email marketing. And I've done email for all types of companies. Um, but specifically, I would say I, in the past, I've been focusing on B2B and SaaS, um, software as a service companies. And I, to be honest, I was a little bit afraid of um, B2C business to consumer. And I thought it was a whole other world and I didn't know anything about it. So I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't go too much into it. And then um, I was a kind of an independent marketing consultant, email marketing consultant for a while, for a few years. And then I got a few e-commerce clients uh, by referral. So I wasn't looking for them. Um, and we started working together and I saw such impressive, incredible results in such a short period of time that I was like, whoa, Actually, I can do this. And the results are mind-blowing. 
Why do you think that was? Like you, you felt comfortable in the B2B and then you moved a little bit kind of to B2C or direct to consumer, you know, however you want to put it. What was the linchpin that made it, I guess, easier, so to speak, to succeed? That is such a great question. Um, I haven't analyzed that um, in particular, but if I have to think on the spot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Was it your writing style? Uh, you know, the the approach, the hook? I mean, I, I don't know a ton about email marketing myself personally. So I'm wondering if the language and, and terminology and their length or the copy changed, like how much? You know, maybe maybe it was that the buying cycle and the purchasing cycle for a customer is very different in B2C and B2B. And in B2B, normally um, the decision-making takes much longer. It's usually a more expensive product and there are usually more touch points included. So yes, we have um, an email program um, and some kind of some kind of email onboarding. But then on top of that, there are salespeople um, and the prospective customer needs to connect with the salespeople. And so that journey is much longer. You have to wait longer to see results. You also kind of need to analyze more um, just to see the full picture. And with B2C, uh, with direct-to-consumer, the price point is much lower. Um, and so a customer makes a decision much faster. And as long as you understand that customer and as long as you understand what they're looking for and what their hesitations are, it's pretty straightforward to just address all of that in email um, and get them to convert. So maybe it was that. Yeah. Again, I just took notes on that and I was like, long timeline is what I wrote. And and a lot of people aren't interested in that, especially depending on the company culture, how much how much you're expected to produce. I mean, there's obviously all those kinds of internal pressures. I think there's a lot less barriers when literally you're going direct to consumer. So that's an interesting take, but uh, we'll get back to it. So then how did you determine like, wow, this is where I need to stay and ultimately grow into this business, which is going to focus directly on e-commerce? You know, what was happening that inspired you to do that? Well, interestingly enough, um, as I started working with e-commerce, I discover, discovered a new email platform for myself called Clavio, and I've heard of it before, um, but very um, very fast, it became clear that it's the best platform for e-commerce, and the reason why the reason why was because the reporting was incredible, and I saw exactly how much revenue each email made. Um, and then there were email automations and within email automations, the reporting was incredible as well. So I could trace the customer journey and specific touch points, uh, which worked, which, which didn't work and where we could optimize things. Um, and I just fell in love with that email platform and with, uh, with e-commerce. And I also saw that it's a, it's a no brainer. Um, I come in, um, I build certain email flows or email automations. Um, and then in 30 days, the, the company's revenue double or more. Um, and it was, it was, you know, by now I'm so used to it. We do it every time with every client that I think it's normal. Um, and even like talking to my husband the other day, we were walking, um, and I was sharing some results and they're like, yeah, this brand, um, they were really under utilizing email. And so in the first month with them, we made seventeen thousand um, dollars just from email. He was like, "Okay, how how much were they making before?" I was like, seven hundred. He was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> and he was blown away. And I was like, "I didn't really thought that was that exciting, uh, just because I'm so used to it." But I realized that it is a big deal, and for companies, it is such a no brainer to kind of to sign up and partner with somebody that can help them get those results. And just internally, um, in terms of running an agency, it made a lot of sense because it's a repeatable process. Sure. Um, it's, it's kind of the same for each e-commerce store. It's just that the very foundation of it, we need to understand that customer. Um, so it's not a template that we just copy paste through every brand. At the beginning, uh, we do everything to understand the customer psychology. But then from there, it is a framework that we just use every time. So in terms of building my own agency, it was very, it was way more straightforward than with anything else that I did before. In terms of hiring people, training people, outsourcing certain things, sales process is so much easier right now because before I was doing kind of like everything and I tried to, like every new company I would talk with, 
I would have to create a custom proposal. Now it's the same thing that sells so well that I'm like, damn. <laughs> really? Oh man. Cause we, we have a proposal software and, and I'll get back to the subject in a second, but we have a proposal software, but we customize it. And I know a lot of people are like, dude, you don't even need a proposal. Just put it in the email and bullet points. Like, and I'm like, I, I'm just, it's, it's, it's high touch what we do. It's a lot of in-person activity. So I feel like it's really important to be like, here's what we've gathered so far type thing. And just really let them know, like we're detail oriented, but at the same time, <laughs> what you're saying sounds fantastic to be like this, this is what it is. Uh, you know, check the box or not, but let me get to two things that you mentioned. One, you said mm -hmm. this company was under utilizing email mm -hmm. by that statement. What, what do you mean by companies who underutilize email? And, and, you know, obviously you've demonstrated that they are missing out on a ton of revenue, but, but what are the behaviors that are preventing them for, from using it or just underutilizing it in general? Um, there are two things. Number one, and that's the biggest one, and that's the one I see um, all e-commerce kind of missing, um, are email automations. So if a brand has email automations, they usually have a couple, the welcome flow and the abandoned cart flow, and they're pretty rudimentary, like a couple emails, no segmentation, no splits. And besides those two email automations, you can build eight more um, that I would say are like pretty foundational. They're not extra. They're not something above and beyond. Like every e-commerce company should have at least 10 key email automations that touch base with the customer or a subscriber at all of the key um, moments in their customer journey. So that's one. So if I show interest potentially because there was some marketing done about this product for an e-commerce brand and I see it on my respective social media platform of choice and I click or learn more or whatever it is, you're saying that there should be a minimum of 10 touch points between in that journey for a company. Like that's how they should pursue it. By 10 email flows, I mean 10 sequences of emails and each yeah. sequence has multiple emails. So more than 10 touch points. Oh, wow. <laughs> but that's not from a lead to a customer. That's yes. from a lead to a brand advocate. Got which it. we define, which a brand advocate would define as a repeat customer that also refers other people. Yes. Got it. And, and I mean, and they could potentially become affiliates, I'm assuming, as well. Most standard direct-to-consumer brands don't have an affiliate program, uh, but uh, more and more have a referral program. So let's just say they refer people, whether for an incentive or not. Maybe they just tell other people about this brand because they love it. So let me ask you this. You're the expert here. I am the consumer. Mm -hmm. If I click learn more, and I get five emails in the next 72 hours. That for me is usually like, I am out of here, like unsubscribe. How, and I think I asked this on my last uh, podcast as well, but how do you get over the fact that you are like, bing, 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 you know, like really <laughs> getting in there? I mean, while knowing, you obviously know there's an upside, okay? But at the same time, if you want to have empathy for the customer to an extent and not, interrupt their journey, which could be very casual, and maybe they're not ready to buy it. How do you make amends with that? And how do you approach it so that you don't lose them before you got them? The most important thing is understanding what they're searching for, what their problem is, and what their hesitations are. And that's what I meant when I said at the very beginning uh, of any engagement, we need to understand customer psychology. And that's what I mean. So every time we email them should be for a reason. And that reason should be um, to either provide information that they're missing to make a decision or overcome their objections. Mm -hmm. um, and if we do that effectively, if we understand what those things are, uh, we will answer questions for, for some people. Some people will still not be ready to buy and that's fine. Um, not everybody who signs up for, for email are going to buy and that's fine, but we try to maximize that. Um, and then just being smart with, you know, with time delays and with timing of emails. And whenever somebody, um, you know, around any type of event, uh, whether that's a, a new subscription or anything else, um, there should be touch email touch points around that, but not five at a time. Sure. Um, so that's just part of the strategy. Okay. I want to get back to one other thing uh, before I get into acquisition and, and retention, which is Clavio. So you mentioned Clavio. Obviously, I'm not familiar. I'm not in that space. 
but you talked about the reporting, uh, the metrics, and, and you've also mentioned numerous times a customer journey. Uh, a lot of people find it odd that you will have recommended for you, kind of like you mentioned on YouTube, like here's a bunch of things recommended for you. Like you, your profile exists in a million different ways, you know, on Facebook, like some of your interests, some of your demographics, some of your political affiliations, you fill all that stuff out. It's not like anyone's going in and taking it. Okay. But you have all these things and talk to me about the things that you analyze and you even mentioned customer psychology, but Tell me some of the things that you're looking at that are, you know, I would say crucial uh, to determining how you are going to help market that brand. So the things that are crucial, especially at the beginning, are not actually in Cladio Mm -hmm. um, because that information is not a lot of times it's not quantitative, it's qualitative Mm -hmm. information. Um, And so it goes back to how well. Uh, because we're just engaging with a brand, it goes back to how well the brand owners understand their own customer. And then we do, um, there are a series of efforts that we can help them with to understand the customers better, including um, surveys, including customer interviews and stuff like that. But it goes back to what I just mentioned. We're looking to know what's the problem they're trying to solve and what are their hesitations Mm -hmm. um, on their road to solving that problem and specifically with these products that they see on this website um, they're not buying immediately so obviously they have some kind of hesitations what are those hesitations and knowing that will allow us um, to overcome those objections and that obviously that information you know it's it's not numbers a lot of people absolutely love the thrill of, of acquiring customers. I mean, that is a very big indicator to many of success. Um, but there also is the customer retention piece, which if people continue to buy from you, I mean, there's literally no better social proof. And you kind of mentioned it earlier with brand advocates. Can you talk to me about how to leverage and pay attention to customer retention a little bit more than uh, acquisition? Sure. Um, That's a great question. And you're completely right. Everybody is obsessed with acquisition, um, especially including e-commerce. Everybody is very focused on acquisition. And then the four groups of effort or customer lifecycle stages that I like to think about as I think about e-commerce marketing, acquisition, which we just talked about briefly, and then there is conversion. So after you acquire a lead, Um, You need to convert them into a customer. Then there's retention. You want to retain that customer and get them to buy from you again. And then after retention, there is uh, brand advocacy. So somebody who is a big fan and helps spread the word about your brand, whether they're incentivized or not. And so acquisition, conversion, retention. Um, Everybody's super focused on acquisition and everybody spends a lot of money driving traffic to their website, which is understandable. And that's what you want. You want eyeballs on your website. But then what happens from there is most of those people are not going to convert on the first visit. And the industry average conversion rate for an e-commerce site is 3.5%. So 96 to 97% of visitors that you paid for, you paid for those visitors to come to your site in most cases, uh, because most uh, companies rely on paid advertising to drive traffic, they're not going to buy. And so that's when we start thinking and talking about conversion. And when we're talking about conversion, there are certain things that you can do to optimize your site to convert better right on the first visit. But then still, even if you optimize it, um, you know, the top percentile of e-commerce stores convert at 10%. That's like the absolute amazing um, conversion rate. Still, 90% are not converting. And so our goal needs to be, if they're not converting on the first visit, um, let's by all means get their email address so that we can continue the conversion efforts through email. And so when I was talking about those email automations that we set up, half of them are focused on conversion. So on converting that first time subscriber into a customer. And then when somebody becomes a customer, then we start focusing on retention because it is five times cheaper to keep an existing customer than to acquire a new one. And so it just makes business sense. Since you've paid for this lead, uh, since you've converted them already, it's so much easier for you uh, to just keep them. If you take a few efforts, um, such as setting up the necessary email flows um, and doing some other things. And so that's a lot of what we focus on is retaining those existing customers. Um, And then once 
they've purchased again and become a repeat purchaser, then we start thinking about how can we, um, obviously this customer likes this product now, they've purchased a couple times. So how do we make it easy for them to spread the word um, to tell their friends and family about it, if we need to incentivize that or not. Uh, what are the other actions that um, that link to increased life um, customer lifetime value? And an example of that could be leaving a review. So leaving a review um, is great for, for a lot of different things, right? Um, it's social proof for new customers, yeah. but also people who leave reviews are way more likely to purchase again. So that's another thing that you kind of need to uh, make sure you ask for um, because it's good on so many levels. At some point, regardless, I am I'm retained, so to speak. I'm a brand advocate. I've left a review. And let's talk, I mean, we kind of mentioned it earlier when we were talking about supplements or things like that. Let's just say I'm like, you know what? Like I am so through <laughs> with drinking this type of protein. I don't care the flavor. I need something new. Retention is, like you said, five times easier. But what happens when you don't have the diversity in offerings, so to speak? Like, what what can you do uh, in order to really make sure that you have another level of potential retention for a customer? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And of course, an obvious question would be to expand your product line so that you have different products to cross sell. But if that's not an option, as I understand, that's part of the question. If if the company doesn't have that, um, there are a few different things. Um, more and more companies start implementing subscription programs. Um, and so especially with things like anything that's edible, um, pr um, protein bars, mm -hmm. snacks, supplements, um, you give people a big discount for subscribing. Um, and that's becoming, I wouldn't say that it's uh, is becoming huge, but it's definitely a growing feature that mm -hmm. many e-commerce companies have. Um, another thing that you could do is you could have a lo loyalty program. Mm -hmm. um, and a loyalty program is where you reward customers for certain things, including making purchases. And so with every purchase that they make, they earn points and then they can redeem those points for um, cash back. Um, and I mean, cash backs obviously work really well sure. um, and uh, nudge, nudge customers to shop with a certain brand, even if they wouldn't choose that brand again for other reasons. Um, maybe they're tired, as you mentioned. But then, you know, if you are really, really sick <laughs> of this flavor, <laughs> um, you are going to switch to another brand and that's fine. And that's just the name of the game. It's just it's it's yeah. it's sometimes inevitable. So yeah, you can you can please everybody all the time. Yes, so. absolutely. So let's talk about uh, you know I I was really curious to ask about what those those top e-commerce brands who you say you know convert at ten percent. I'm assuming there is probably some things that uh, I would say newcomers to the space underestimate, and one of those things was probably being personal in, in marketing and, you know, underestimating that because you're probably just too focused on just saying, hey, here's why we're different. Here's why we're different. Here's my unique value proposition. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and, and why being personal still actually applies greatly as an advantage in e-commerce? Being personal works really, really well. Um, and I think we're seeing a big trend of consumers Consumers wanting to have some sort of relationship with a brand, like that sounds weird to have a relationship with a brand, but it works great when a consumer can identify a brand with certain emotions in their, in their head and they can remember that brand for something as if that brand had a personality. Yes. Um, <laughs> and we see a lot of kind of one product brands appearing where this brand only sells one product. And they usually have a very, very good kind of uh, strongly defined personality and it works really great for them. It's just that humans connect best with humans, you know? And if your brand has a human side to it and if you write as a human, um, if things on your website read as if a human wrote them, you're just going to build a better connection with, with other humans and as a result, sell more stuff. It's very now, straightforward. Yeah, no, I, I trust me, you are speaking my language. And... Um, one thing we we discussed when we first met on LinkedIn was how sometimes uh, pretty pictures and, and discounts uh, don't don't really don't really do it. 
Do you have any, any examples of, of maybe people that you've worked with that were kind of in that realm and you helped them pivot a little bit and, and some of the things that you, you notice as hopefully they actually gained revenue and made a, a turn for the better? Definitely. That's a big thing. One of the big things that we like to experiment with is uh, <laughs> winning the fight of convincing an e-commerce brand that is used to sending HTML beautiful design emails, convince them to send a plain text email to their audience um, and just address them from the founder and say, hey, you know, I've noticed that you signed up. What's up? Um, you know, what are you up to? I don't know, but asking um, obviously relevant questions um, to that brand and their products and then seeing how that affects um, not only email performance, but also sales um, and kind of like overall um, communication with the customers. And customers love that. Um, those emails get so many responses. People are eager to connect with brands um, if the brands make space for that. Um, and so A, emails like that get incredibly valuable customer insights. And that's the customer research that I was talking a lot about at the beginning, where we want to understand how they think, what are their problems, what are their hesitations. That's one of the great ways to get those insights from customers directly. Just send them a plain text email. Um, don't be afraid about sending a plain text email to 20,000 people. It's okay. <laughs> you will get thousands of replies, but that's fantastic for understanding your customer and your email deliverability as well, because when people respond, that's great. Yeah. Uh -huh. Let me ask. Sorry. Like, so this sounds so I'm plain text sounds plain, right? It just sounds like there is nothing flashy, nothing sexy here. This is like bare Formatted, bones. But, it, but it's just text. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's just direct minimized correspondence. Like I am very big into pattern interruption. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, would you argue that because everyone yeah. does the HTML and tries to be so pretty and flashy that that the plain text is actually a pattern interrupter by nature or that? Yeah. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It is a huge pattern interrupt. And if you want to concrete use cases for pl plain text emails, they're great for sunset unengaged subscribers flows. So sunset unengaged subscribers email automation is an email sequence that you send to people who have been unengaged for an X number of days, usually 90 days, let's say 100 days. They haven't opened or clicked anything um, in more than three months. And so instead of sending them another discount, you send a plain text email addressed from the founder saying, hey, Rich, I noticed that you haven't been opening our emails. That's completely cool. Everybody gets busy, but I'm wondering, you know, what's on your mind? And then and keeping it, it at that actually. And yeah. just asking asking a very um asking a concrete question yes. so that people hit reply and respond to that question and then making it clear to people, hey, just hit reply um and let me know. I read every response. And instead of instead of sending another discount like every other brand would, um, you're now, like you immediately stand out. And then um, that flow is usually three emails. And that last third email is only sent if the person still didn't engage, so still didn't open. And the subject line should be something like uh, time to say goodbye or something like that. And in the email you say, hey Rich, I see you're still not opening the emails. Um, that's completely cool you're probably not interested anymore, which we understand. And since you're not, the last thing we'd want to do is bother you with updates. So we're going to unsubscribe you for now. <laughs> if, oh man, if, that's never happened to me before. I'd be, I, I might think twice in that moment just to be like, wait a second, you're going to unsubscribe me? <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's what the pattern interrupt is. <laughs> and so every, every, almost every recipient in that uh, scenario would pause and say, oh, hey, what is this brand? <laughs> At the minimum, they're going to remember you. Uh, most people who open that, they actually click through to stay subscribed. And if they actually wanted to unsubscribe, great. So you don't keep paying for subscribers who are not interested. Get them to I, unsubscribe. I love that. All right. And my final question for today is this. Ryan Dice, I just had him on my podcast uh, last week. And a, a year ago, I met him at this uh, conference thrown by drift called hypergrowth. And when he was on stage, it was really interesting. He said one thing that stood out 
like like a meteor to me, which was the only app everyone goes to every day is their email. And I was just like, that's really interesting. When it comes to email, because I'm asking you because you have history in email marketing and, and everything you're doing, all those social media platforms exist to sell. I know, I know when I open Instagram later, there's going to be some sort of sponsored ad for some sort of product. And I know the same thing's going to happen on Facebook. I know it's probably going to happen on YouTube. If I happen to type in Nissan Murano tires, next thing I know, I'm going to get blown up with tire ads and stuff like that. Why is it uh, that email fundamentally could have more success in some of these social media platforms? Well, for one, it's an owned marketing channel. Any type of social media uh, where you either trying to get organic reach, so just posting um, organically or paying for ads, um, still same thing. You're not, you don't own that audience. Um, and the moment Facebook, Instagram, any other social platform decides to change their algorithms, decides to change the rules for how to, you reach your audience, you're screwed. Um, with email, that's not going to happen. You own um, that customer customer information from start until they unsubscribe. And so you just have a lot more room for different maneuvers and for different ways to do the same thing. Answer the those questions that I, I talked about throughout this whole call. And specifically, those questions are why buy from you and why buy now? Mm -hmm. So you just keep answering those questions for your customer. You're very limited at how you can do that on social media, and you have a lot more sp uh, room and space uh, with email. So that's one. Another thing is social media is great for reach and for awareness. So a lot of times, social media is how we first hear about a new product or a new brand. Um, but then most customers do need more touch points. Um, and again, they've heard about your brand. They went to your website. They kind of checked it out. They're not ready to buy on the first visit. If you get their email address, you now have a good chance of getting, um, getting your message in front of them on a consistent basis. On social media, you can't control that. Yes, you can pay to reach the same customer, but you don't know where that ad is going to end up because you have so like so little control over that process. So I would say both are important. Um, mm -hmm. Social media is great, um, again, especially for awareness. But if you want to convert and retain, um, you need to own the customer journey. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. I, I lied. I do have one more question. Where okay. can people <laughs> find you and how should people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Maybe they have aspirations of doing what you do or simply maybe have a question that they could ask you that hopefully you could answer quickly. I think the best way to get in touch with me is on LinkedIn. Um, so just search Casey Luck, Casey with K, Luck as in L-U-C-K. Um, I post a lot on LinkedIn too. So um, I try to post useful, helpful content for e-commerce companies and for email marketers and really marketers in general. Um, so follow, connect with me. We'll connect there. Um, and if you want to learn more about what we do at Luck & Co. Agency, go to luckandco.agency. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time and your insight. And we will talk soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. All right, everyone. So there we go. Leadership Locker, another one in the books. Please feel free to reach out to Casey. I know we talked for a while after the podcast about how we potentially could collaborate, but hopefully you took out a lot about e-commerce, target audience, the customer journey, four stages, how many touch points there are. Uh, so please, if you got anything out of it, you know the deal. If you can rate and review this or just give me feedback, I want to make sure I'm pushing out the most relevant and helpful information for you. Whether it's good or bad, I will take the review. I will own it uh, so I can be better. All that being said, thank you so much for joining and staying, and I will see you next week.